Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that I'm mostly wondering because um, when I was taking the practice quiz, I felt that the slides could have been helpful during that. I know it's not due until um, tomorrow. So I just wanted to know when to anticipate uh, seeing those slides. Do you have a quiz tomorrow? Let me take a look at that because we're still working on chapter one. Yeah, Oops, it's just one of the practice zero zero. Oh, yeah, days. practice zero zero quiz. All right. Well, you're getting extra credit for that one, so I'm not really <laughs> worried about uh, worry about that one. All right, let's okay. take a look at the schedule here. So today is Tuesday, October 28th, and hopefully we're going to finish chapter one today and begin chapter two. Now, when we finish chapter one, if somebody reminds me, I can try and uh, get that posted. Otherwise, I'll do it after the lecture and somebody can remind me uh, of that as well. So anyways, okay. we should finish chapter one today and start chapter two. And let me remind you that you're going to be having the uh, That doesn't sound right. The online plagiarism quiz. That should have been done uh, this Saturday, I think. I think I've got an error there. Let me look that up. And uh, there is the practice quiz on Wednesday. Let me mm -hmm. look up this online plagiarism quiz because I'm a little messed up on that. <clears throat> this might take me a while. So I gotta log into Clark and then get into Canvas. Uh, nice, it's automatically filled in for me. Am I recording? Does anyone know? Yes. yes. Thank you. I'm looking up the online plagiarism quiz. Yeah, the plagiarism quiz was supposed to be due September 25th. I've got an error in the syllabus because it was saying week two, but uh, it was going to be due Saturday of week one. Now, I've got a correct right up there. I yeah, I think the correct instead here. of the plagiarism. Yeah, no, I'm just saying the it's correct thing. here. Mm -hmm. Just erase that. Um, I noticed there was one other change in the syllabus, and hopefully I made that available online. It's not going to apply to most of you. I'm trying to remember what it was. It's not in the schedule. Um, Oh, I don't remember what that was. It was something with the state of Washington. And I think they're requiring us to state what our policy is about. Uh, students who request time off from class for religious or some other reason, which I'm, it's not coming to me what it is. And to do that, you have to notify me within the first two weeks that you're going to be taking off, I don't know, like week four, for religious reasons, okay? And you have to explain what the religious reasons are. I mean, you can't simply say, ah, I'm gonna go visit my grandmother and that's doing goodwill and therefore it's a religious reason, so I'm gonna take a week off. That won't count. You do have to, uh, what did I say? Um, explain it and it has to sound reasonable or else I'll look into it. Um, anyways, uh, if you're taking time off from class, uh, you have to notify me within the first two weeks. And hopefully if you're doing that, it'll be October 2nd. And actually I hope most of you don't do that because you'll have to um, schedule when you're gonna be taking what you're gonna miss and when you're gonna get it in. <clears throat> and it's curious the way the 
colleagues have said, I have to make accommodation for you, but I can make accommodation for you by requiring you to take the quizzes early, as well as you might be taking them late. And I'm just saying there was a change in the syllabus over there. Um, I think that's what it was. And hopefully you won't use that. Uh, anyways, we're going to be hopefully finishing chapter one and going on to chapter two today. And then we'll be doing lab 02 on aseptic transfers in the lab today. And do remember on Wednesday, you must complete the practice quiz. It's worth zero points because I will go in and manually give you credit. I think there's two quizzes. One is a multiple choice quiz, which would be like the questions in your multiple choice quizzes. And then the second quiz is a short fill in the answer or a short question, meaning you might have to give an, uh, a sentence or two to explain it. And I'll give you one point for each quiz. One of them, it might even be worth two points. You can look that up. Okay, any questions about any of that? And it'll be extra credit. Uh, you should try to take the uh, multiple choice exam because it uses Respondus Lockdown Browser. And I do want you to get that downloaded if you've never downloaded it and uh, run it because you'll need to get it running for the quizzes. And it's best to find out if you have a problem with it early rather than late. Because if you have a problem with it, you'll need to first contact me to let me know that there's a problem, but I'm not gonna probably be able to help you. And then contact the computer help desk. And they're very good at getting it up and running on people's computers. About every other term, not even every term, there is one student who has a problem downloading it. And the problem isn't really the download. And there was one student who downloaded it, didn't get it to work, erased it, and she downloaded it five times and it didn't get to work. Okay, that's not the problem. The problem is, is that your settings on your computer are not correct for the lockdown browser. And the computer help desk will be very good at helping you change your settings so the lockdown browser will work. Any question about any of that? Anyways, do the uh, practice quiz and then you will make sure that your lockdown browser was working because you have to use it to do the real quizzes. Any questions about that? All right. No questions. Let's begin the lesson where we stopped. Ah, let's see. So we had talked about the different kingdoms and we talked about uh, the domain Eukarya, how it has. Uh, Four kingdoms, that's the approach we'll use, the kingdom animals, plants, fungi, and protista. And we discussed the fungi last. So let's move on and talk about the kingdom protista. We will talk a little bit about this kingdom in microbiology because some members of protista cause disease in humans. Some of the protista are plant-like protists, and that includes the algae. They have cellulose in their cell walls, the same as plant cells. They engage in photosynthesis to get their energy needs. Some, well, actually the algae, all of them produce oxygen. In organic compounds, like green plants, uh, mainly referring to glucose, but other compounds too. Some of the protista are animal-like, 
And these we call protozoa. They include the amoeba, the paramecium. <laughs> Excuse me. I knew that was coming. Bless you. Thank you. Uh, and the euglena, uh, they absorb or ingest organic chemicals, much like we do that when we ingest glucose. Uh, they can be motile via pseudopods, cilia, or flagella. If you remember the bacteria, if they're motile, they only have flagella. Well, the eukaryotes can move by flagella, cilia, and pseudopods. And we'll talk a little bit more about those later. Some of the protozoa are parasites, and so we will be talking about the protozoa. There are also protista, which are fungus-like, and we're just going to call them fungus-like uh, protists. Um, what was that disease that killed the potatoes in Ireland, and it caused a whole bunch of Irish to migrate to America? Does anyone remember potato blight or something like that? Uh, that's actually a fungus-like protus. All right, any question about the protista? Uh, here we're looking at an amoeba and uh, an al algae. Uh, this is a colonial algae, and it has baby colonies inside of it. Each dot is actually a cell. We need to talk briefly about the kingdom plantae. It includes the mosses, the ferns, the conifers, and the flowering plants. All plants are multicellular. We're not going to talk much about the plants in this class because none of the plants cause diseases in humans. There's also the kingdom animalia, the animals, including the sponges. The worms, which scientists call helminths, the insects, the vertebrates, all of the animals are also multicellular. We will talk a little bit about the animals in this class because the helminths can cause infectious diseases among humans. Any question about that? And the helminths or the worms actually are studied by microbiologists, largely because they cause infectious diseases among humans and microbiologists study infectious diseases. But the infectious stages are usually microscopic. So if a worm is a, a parasite of humans, the infective stage is usually microscopic. There are a few exceptions, which I guess you could argue that those which burrow into human skin, it is microscopic because we really can't see them. Excuse me here. That's happening after I sneezed. Ah. Allergies from when the storm went through. All right. I guess I haven't talked about what comes under the umbrella of microorganisms, the bacteria, the archaea, the viruses and prions, which are not organisms. So realize these are special. But we do call them microbes because they cause human disease. Uh, certain of the eukarya come under the microorganisms. Um, all of the protozoa, all of the protists, which are single cells, are microorganisms. And that includes the molds and the yeast, which are actually fungi. Uh, some of the algae, if they're single cell, they're definitely microorganisms. The helminths are also considered a microbe or a microorganism 
even though the adult worms are not microscopic. They are multicellular animals. Many of them are parasitic. Of the parasitic elements, they are in the, let's see, phyla flatworms or phylum, actually that's not a phylum, that's um, what's above that? I forget. Uh, round worms. They're not strictly microorganisms, but they cause human disease. And usually the infective stage in human is microscopic. For most of the helminths, the infective stage is a fertilized egg. Viruses are also a microbe. Remember, they are acellular, so they are special microbes. They have either DNA or RNA as their core molecule, meaning their core genome. But they do not have both. It's either DNA or RNA. Realize that RNA is unusual for all of the cellular organisms for their genome. We have RNA. It's just not our genome. The core molecule in the virus is surrounded by a protein coat. The coat may be surrounded or enclosed in a lipid envelope. And viruses only replicate when they are in their host cell. Viruses, as well as prions, are not part of the three domain system because they're not cellular. Any question about any of them? All right, this slide is just showing you the cellular organisms comparing the bacteria, the archaea, the eukaryotes. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. Um, oh, let's move on. The next topic is a brief history of microbiology. The history of microbiology, at least initially, largely concerned the debate whether spontaneous generation of microbes could occur or whether microbes came about by the theory of biogenesis. And then uh, the early history of microbiology is known as the golden age of microbiology, where when microbiologists were studying something, almost everything they studied was something new. And the golden age, you don't need to know when it is, but it was from 1857 to about 1914, when there was a lot of advancements in microbiology. And it just called the golden age. Any question about any of that? This slide is showing you a history of microbiology, and this is the early timeline. This is stuff before microbiology. So uh, let me see if I can blow that up. Microbiology largely begun, begins with the work of Louis Pasteur. And the first was his work on fermentation. We'll talk about that later. So when we're talking about the history of microbiology, I'm going to give you dates. But you don't need to know any of the dates except for the first one. The first one, you need to know that over 3.5 billion years ago, we can find in the fossil record ancestors of the first bacteria, the first life on Earth. And here you're actually looking at fossils of fossil bacteria. And this is the artist rendition of that. Okay, so 3.5 billion years ago, the first record we have of life on Earth, which were early bacteria or something similar to them. The next one was uh, 4,300 BC. The Babylonians wrote on their clay tablets recipes for making beer. And they didn't know it was using microbes, 
but that is how beer was made. And then around 600 AD, the Mayans made a fermented beverage from cacao, which to us would be similar to a liquid chocolate. Now, I may ask you to about the relative order of things. So if I'm asking you about uh, the Mayans and when they made fermented beverages from cacao, you should know that before that, the Babylonians were the first to write down a record of a microbe making beer, because they didn't know that microbes were making beer. They just wrote down how to make beer. And then before that, there had to be uh, the first ancestors of life on the planet Earth. Okay, so you should know the relative order of things, but you don't know, need to know the years except for this first one. Any question about any of that? In the 16th century, 1590, Janssen developed the compound microscope. And obviously that was important for microbiology. Without the microscope, you couldn't have the study of microbes. But the first cells were not seen for, what is that? About 75 years later, Robert Hooke took a microscope and then looked at, it was actually a cork, uh, which is both uh, something you plug a bottle of wine with and uh, uh, it's something that we plug something with and it's also called uh, the uh, bark on the cork tree and then cork is also the name of the tree. But what he did was he took the bark from the cork tree, which is cork, and looked under, under the microscope and he saw the first cells. There were little boxes that reminded him of the shape of cells in a monastery. Okay, and let me see if I can get paint out and then I can draw this. Uh, if I'm not quick, I won't do it, but let me see if I can be quick. Fairly quick. So what he did was he saw cells and in a monastery where the monks were staying, their own personal room were called cells. And they just looked something like this. They should be a little straighter. I'm not drawing real straight, sorry. I'm not an artist. Okay. And it reminded Robert Hook of the cells in the monastery. So that's what he called them. Any question about that? Uh, these were plant cells that he looked at. This began the theory of the cell theory that all living things are composed of cell. However, in Robert Hooke's day in almost 400 years, the early microbiologists were not able to see cells in animals. And it's because the microscopes were primitive and they couldn't focus really sharply. And what do plant cells have that animal cells lack that makes the cells of the plants stand up and stand out much easier than the cells of an animal? What does a plant cells have that animals lack? So Come on, somebody's got to know. Say again. Cell so, wall. Yeah. Plant cells have the cell wall. And with the primitive microscopes, they could see the cell wall on plants. And they couldn't see them until the microscopes got better. And that happened about 100 years after Robert Hooke reported the first cells that we could see cells and animal cells. Now the above are not specifically microbiology because Robert Hooke was looking at cells in plants, which are not microbes. 
as I stated, the history of microbiology largely concerned two competing hypotheses to explain how life began. One was the theory of spontaneous generation, that life arises from, I don't know, inorganic substances. And they stated, the people who believed in this, that a vo vital force came into the substances and then changed the substances into microbial life. And the competing theory was a theory of biogenesis that life arises only from other living things. And obviously a baby only comes from two parents, but with microbes, it was much more difficult to ascertain, especially in the early days, because when they would make their sterile media and then put it into a container, microbes would start growing in the container. And they didn't realize the microbes were already in the container, as well as falling out of the air. There was a number of things that uh, the proponents of spontaneous generation used as proof that spontaneous generation could occur. For one thing, when you threw a log in the fire, sometimes a newt would crawl out and the spontaneous generation people would say, ah, fire and wood spontaneously generates newts, okay? And then flies would emerge from manure they would, I don't know, hatch in the manure and then give rise to a fly. Uh, maggots would arise from decaying corpses. Most were logical, but not some scientific. Some were amusing. For example, somebody wrote up very uh, detailed instructions of how if you put sweaty underwear in a jar that had wheat grains in it, it would spontaneously give rise to mice. Now, in reality, what happened was the mice were in the house and they smelled or saw the, the uh, wheat in the jar. So they climbed into the jar to get at the grain and then they couldn't climb out of the jar. And that's how the mice came about. The sweaty underwear had nothing to do with it. The first evidence for or against spontaneous generation came from Francesco Aretti. And you should know this guy, not necessarily when he did it, but you should know that he also did the first controlled scientific experiment. In 1668, he got three jars that were completely open to the air. And he put meat inside the jars and then watched the meat over time and maggots appeared in the meat. He got three jars that were completely sealed and no maggots occurred in the meat in those jars. The spontaneous generation people said, no, that doesn't count because you didn't, you sealed it. You didn't let the vital forces from the air come in to spontaneously generate the maggots. So what he did was, and this is very ingenious, he got a wire mesh and put it over the jars and then put meat in the jar and then discovered that the meat got no maggots. Uh, the maggots came, at least in the open jars, from flies flying in, laying their eggs, and then the maggots uh, were the eggs that hatched. And with the wire mesh, the flies couldn't get into the meat and so there were no maggots. So this is the first result that did not support spontaneous generation. And after Francesco Reddy's experiment, people were willing to say that at least large creatures, large I don't know, life forms could not spontaneous gen spontaneously generate. But they said that the microbes could. And that's because, as I stated, microbes could fall in from the air and they were in the container 
uh, when you poured in the ster sterile broth. About this time, the first true microbiology observations were made. This was done by Antoni van Leeuwenhoek, and I might be butchering his name, I'm not Dutch. He was actually a merchant, but an amateur biologist. And he did a lot of observations, as well as he made his own microscopes. And in his day, to make microscopes, he had to actually grind the lenses himself. And he was the best lens grinder of his day, as well as the best microscope builder of his day. And then he used his microscopes to look at things. And he looked at scrapings from teeth, rainwater, peppercorn infusions, and uh, the water from the River Thames, which is the water that was uh, bringing water to the city of London, at least in his day. And then people were drinking out of the, the River Thames, or at least that water. And he did, reported microbes wherever he looked, meaning in teeth scrapings and rainwater and peppercorn infusions and from the River Thames. Antoni van Leeuwenhoek was such a good microscope builder and lens grinder. Uh, this is actually one of the microscopes that he built. And as you can notice, it's very primitive, at least to our standards. It's also a simple microscope because all it has is one lens. So in reality, it is a super duper magnifying glass if it only has one lens. But uh, as stated, uh, he was such a good microscope builder that he actually saw cells so small that they were not seen by anyone else for another 100 years. And why it took 100 years to see those cells is because the microscopes got better over time and it took them 100 years to catch up to the, uh, oh, what am I trying to say? The ability of Antoni van Leeuwenhoek's microscopes to see these cells. What you're seeing here is cells so small that they were not seen for a hundred years. These are bacteria. There's a rod, that's the movement of a rod. There's a spirilla. Those are more rods, that's a bent rod. And those are cocci. So Antoni van Leeuwenhoek saw bacteria about a century before anyone else, and just because he was such a good microscope builder as well as a lens grinder. Any question about any of that? Uh, let me state briefly the theory of biogenesis was formally written out, meaning it was a theory beforehand, but it was formally written out by uh, 1858 by uh, Rudolf Virchow. And he made the theory that all living things come from other living things, including microbe cells come from cells. Okay, but in his day, he couldn't prove it. It wasn't until uh, Louis Pasteur in 1861 was able to show that spontaneous generation of microbes did not occur and that they occurred by biogenesis. What Louis Pasteur did to disprove spontaneous generation was he found that microbes are present in the air and they could fall out of the air and contaminate something. Why the beakers would be growing microbes if you didn't culture the microbes in it. And he also discovered that microbes could be destroyed by heat. So this is one way that we can sterilize something and then 
uh, keep it, uh, I don't know, sterile, uh, using heat. But it was his ingenious and famous swan neck flask experiments that disproved the theory of spontaneous generation. What he did was he got a flask like this, it's glass, poured in broth, and then he heated the glass right here and bent it into a swan neck. And then he heated the media to sterilize it and then allowed it to cool. When he did, the cool media never became contaminated. And he proposed that the bacteria from the air would fall down to here, but the bacteria and whatnot, the microbes would not go beyond this region. And you could get the microbes to grow if you brought the media up in here and then brought it back. Any question about that? Anyways, because the media never became contaminated and it was open to the vital forces coming in from the air, vital forces could come in. The bacteria in theory could come in, it's just that gravity trapped them right there. Any questions about Pasteur's experiment? Okay, so Pasteur disproved the theory of biogenesis, excuse me, the theory of spontaneous generation, and thereby uh, proving the uh, theory of biogenesis. And I'm using the word proof for proving in uh, soft layman's term, not a hard uh, scientific term, meaning uh, uh, he only found evidence to support the theory of biogenesis. He never really proved it, at least when we're talking about proof and the scientific term. Any question about any of that? All right, beginning with Pasteur's work, a number of discoveries happen including the relationship between microbes and disease. And that gave rise to the germ theory of disease that microbes or germs in short could uh, cause disease. Pasteur's work also led to the development of immunity and the development of antimicrobial drugs. Following Pasteur's work, there was a lot of work in microbiology. In 1850, Pasteur actually developed a basic technique for getting uh, aseptic cultures, and he called it aseptic technique, where when you're working with a culture, you purify it down to one species, and then you only inoculate that using aseptic technique, and then you keep the dish sterile by, like, for example, covering it so it can't be contaminated. Uh, Dr. Koch further developed that by uh, making an easy way to obtain pure cultures, and that was streaking for colony isolation on solid media. Louis Pasteur did develop a means for obtaining a pure culture, but it was using broth cultures, and he did limiting dilution. And so he would make a dilution and 10 copies of it, and then dilute that one to 10, make 10 copies of that, dilute that one to 10, make 10 copies of that, inoculate them by the dilution. And uh, if something had nine out of the 10 flasks, with no growth in it, and one out of the 10 flasks with growth in it, Louis Pasteur made the assumption that that growth was caused by essentially one cell and therefore was a pure culture. Any question about any of that? Anyways, that's a difficult way to develop a pure culture. It's much easier to streak on auger or some solid media get your colonies, do the streak a second time to ensure you have pure culture, 
and then grow that up. And we say that'll be a pure culture. And over 95% of the time, it is a pure culture. Okay, any questions about that? In 1882, Hess, a person, what do you call that, a technician working in Dr. Cox's lab, developed nutrient auger, a new solid medium for growing microbes. And it was good because many microbes could grow. It's not selective. And then it's rich, so many microbes can grow. It's also cheap. I guess that's another reason why, why it's good. And it's frequently used in microbiology labs because it's cheap. Any question about that? In the 1880s to 1892, Sergei Winogradsky ignored the uh, studying of a pure culture and uh, studied bacteria growing all together, different species. And he developed the idea that microorganisms were involved in the biogeochemical cycles on Earth, such as the nitrogen cycle and the sulfur cycle. Any question about that? Uh, to follow these cycles, you have to use uh, a community of different organisms. And that's why uh, Winogradsky could not have done his work if he had been working with pure cultures. Most of the time, microbiologists, if they want to study a culture, they need a pure culture. But not if you're doing something where you need many different species to make the uh, biogeochemical cycle, like many different species are involved in nitrogen, uh, the nitrogen cycle. I'll just word it that way. All right, any questions about any of that? Okay. Well, shortly after Louis Pasteur showed that uh, spontaneous generation did not occur, he then worked on pasteurization. What happened was the beer and the wine were spoiling, becoming acidic, unpalatable flavor. And they turned to Louis Pasteur to find out why. And he found out that it was because of microorganisms growing in the beer and the wine and spoiling the alcohol. Uh, Louis Pasteur studied this a little bit further and he found that alcoholic fermentation occurs because of microorganisms making the alcohol. And that is the alcoholic fermentation where microbes convert sugar to alcohol. And that is used in the making of beer and wine and sourdough bread. What else do I wanna say about that? Hmm. Anyways, uh, Louis Pasteur studied that and found that microbes could undergo alcoholic fermentation, changing beer into wine. And it's true the microbes do this, but actually you can convert sugar into wine if you simply use the correct enzymes. And of course, the, the microbes that uh, Louis Pasteur was studying made the correct enzymes. And then Louis Pasteur found out that other microbes, meaning microbes that do not make alcohol, would use the alcohol and metabolize it into some other product, especially acetic acid, which is the, the main ingredient in vinegar. It gives vinegar its sour flavor. Anyways, Louis Pasteur found out that microbes can convert the alcohol to acetic acid. And that was what was spoiling the beer and the wine. Louis Pasteur studied that further and he came up with a way to protect the beer and the wine 
and we call it pasteurization, where you heat the liquid or gas to a high enough temperature to kill off the spoilage bacteria or the bacteria causing disease, but you do not kill all of the microbes, just enough of the correct ones. And that is what we call pa pasteurization. The application of a high heat for a short time period. We use pasteurization in a large variety of foods, including cheese, chocolate, Oh, uh, sausage, a bunch of food like that. So if microbes could ferment sugar into alcohol and change it into a different substance, meaning the sugar to make the wine or the beer, the idea of the germ theory arose. And that is might germs be responsible for causing disease, as well as microbe being responsible for uh, causing the alcoholic fermentation, and then other microbes in using the alcohol that's been fermented and ferment it further into acetic acid. Uh, the germ theory of disease was an important milestone in biology because originally people thought that poisonous vapors were responsible for at least some infectious diseases. For example, they said, ah, oh, you went walking through a swamp, that's why you have cholera. And it never occurred to them that maybe the cholera bacteria is alive in the swamp and somebody walking through the swamp will pick up the cholera bacteria and then get cholera. Any questions about any of that? The germ theory of disease, I'm not gonna talk about further. Let's move on to Robert Koch was the person who proved that a bacterium causes a given disease. And this he did in 1876. He showed that the bacteria Bacillus anthraxis causes anthrax disease. And then he went and published his steps that he was using to show that a given microbes, that a given microbe causes a specific disease. And he stated, and we still use it today, that in order to say that a given microbe causes disease, you have to go through these steps showing that this organism causes disease. Any question about any of that? All right. Somebody is there, correct? Yeah, we're here. Uh, yes. You're so quiet, I was just afraid. Gosh, what if nobody's here? All right. Uh, around this time, the first vaccination was discovered. Uh, the first vaccination was done by Edward Jenner in 1796. He vaccinated people using the cowpox virus to protect people from getting smallpox. Smallpox was a dreaded disease that could go around killing people. And cowpox was a very mild disease that gave a one or very few uh, skin lesions, something similar to a mosquito bite. And when people got cowpox, it was a very mild disease. Anyways, he used the cowpox virus to, as against a vaccine against smallpox. He did not know why cowpox 
was protecting against the disease smallpox. That came later, and that came out of Louis Pasteur's work, once again, Louis Pasteur, and he showed that why cowpox was protecting against smallpox is that the two viruses are related, and they're related enough it's that when the body mounts an immune response against cowpox, some of that immunity also responds to cowpox. And did I say that right? Also responds to smallpox. And so if you give people the cowpox virus, they will become immune to cowpox and they will also become immune to smallpox because some of the immunity will cross over and react with smallpox. Any question about any of that? The important things is that cowpox is similar enough to smallpox that when our body responds with the immune system against cowpox, it will also respond against smallpox. Vaccination is a term derived from vaca, which means cow. And vaccination comes from the fact that the first vaccine was uh, cowpox, the cowpox virus. Now the protection from a vaccine is called immunity. Any question about any of that? All right, the next advancement in microbiology was the development of chemotherapy. Uh, Paul Ehrlich went around saying, it would be really wonderful if we found a compound which will be the magic bullet and kill off an infectious disease and leave the patient unhindered. And that is what chemotherapy is. However, Chemotherapy nowadays refers to, and only refers to, uh, at least when we're using its, uh, what is in the narrow sense, that uh, it refers to uh, anti-cancer drugs. So chemotherapy means an anti-cancer drug. But in reality, chemotherapy is the treatment of any disease with any chemical. The drug can be of two types, a synthetic drug, which means humans make it, or an antibiotic, which means humans do not make it, at least not directly, and we have a microbe which makes the antibiotic. So strictly speaking, and this is a textbook definition, an antibiotic is a chemical produced by a living organism that inhibits or kills other microbes. By this strict definition of an antibiotic, penicillin G is an antibiotic, okay? But ampicillin, which is really one of the early members of the penicillin family to be developed and widely available, ampicillin is not strictly an antibiotic, even though it's in the same family as penicillin G, because it's not made only by a living organism. With antibiotics, what they do is they make penicillin G by the microbe and then uh, change the penicillin G into ampicillin. And this we have a term for too, you don't need to know it, but it's called the semi-synthetic where a microbe starts the process, but then a human finishes the process. Uh, Semi-synthetic chemotherapeutic agent or antibiotic. Now, please understand this textbook definition of an antibiotic is not the way most people use that term, including clinicians and people working in the clinic. The term antibiotic means 
a drug which is used against uh, bacteria. And that's the way I'll use the term antibiotic, not the textbook's narrow definition where uh, you have to have a living organism make it in order for it to be called an antibiotic. I do not usually use the term a synthetic drug or even a semi-synthetic drug. You could say a semi-synthetic antibiotic, for example. Uh, but uh, let's see, ampicillin is a semi-synthetic. And then I think it's carboxacillin is a uh, synthetic antibiotic meaning we make this one in the microbiology or in the laboratory and they make it from scratch. You have to add in the correct ingredients like carbon and oxygen, glucose, things like that. Sorry, my eyes are itching. Uh, any question about antibiotics and how we'll be using it? The first chemotherapeutic agent was actually quinine from the bark of the cinchona tree. And this is the first drug that the West discovered that was effective on a microbe. Quinine is today still the primary drug of choice to treat and cure malaria at least if the malaria is not resistant to quinine. While Ehrlich found the first drug other than uh, quinine in the bark of the cinchona tree that was used to treat a microbe, he found a drug, it's a synthetic arsenic drug, Salvarsen, that he used to treat syphilis in 1910. And he called this the magic bullet, a drug that would harm the microbe, but leave the patient alone. And that wasn't exactly true of Salvar Sun, because it's a synthetic arsenic drug. And if you don't know, arsenic has been the drug of choice by wives to kill off their husbands for centuries. The point being that salvarsan is a synthetic of arsenic, and arsenic is highly toxic to us. Any question about any of that? The first antibiotic was discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928. What he did was he was a sloppy microbiologist and he streaked out a plate of uh, bacteria. And then he left the plate on the counter uh, as opposed to putting it in the incubator. And then he went on vacation for the weekend. When he came back, he looked at his plate that he streaked out and he found the plate with the streak but he also found that it was contaminated by a mold culture. But what he noticed was around that mold, there was a region where the bacteria in the streak would not grow. And Alexander Fleming correctly concluded that something was diffusing out of this colony of mold and preventing the bacteria from growing. And this we know today is an antibiotic that is frequently made by either fungi like mold or another bacteria like streptomyces, makes streptomycin. Uh, Alexander Fleming was very lucky because, first of all, he didn't intend to get the contamination. He just observed it and noticed that there was a ring around it that he correctly concluded was uh, a zone of inhibition by the antibiotic coming out of this one, uh, the colony. 
And then he was lucky that he left it on the counter because that allowed the bacteria and the mold to grow. If he put it in the incubator, I think only the bacteria would have grown. All right, any questions about penicillin and what we've discussed? You should understand that penicillin was the first antibiotic discovered, but it was not the first to be clinically available. In 1935, there was a German scientist, I don't remember his name, who developed the sulfur drugs, specifically sulfonamide, and it was man-made, so it's a synthesized antibiotic, but it was the first clinically available antibody. And it became available shortly after uh, 1935. Since the 1940s, penicillin has been used, but it's been a problem because we use penicillin and then uh, test and mass produce in mass, and that can give rise to antibiotic resistance. And so a number of microbial species have become resistant to penicillin G. Specifically, one that I can think of is Staphylococcus aureus. Initially, could be used, or penicillin G could be used against Staphylococcus aureus. Nowadays, they don't use penicillin G because Staphylococcus aureus tends to be resistant to penicillin G, meaning it won't be resistant in all patients, but in the majority of patients, uh, Staphylococcus aureus is resistant to penicillin G. Any questions about any of that? I'm not going to finish chapter one, I think. A bacteria are once classified as plants, hence the term flora or microflora for microbes. That is the term that I learned when I went through school and took microbiology. So if I ever use the term flora or microflora, remind me that I'm using an old term and I should be calling it the microbiota. The normal microbiota is the microbes that are present, and they're normally present, in and on a person, and then live with that person for essentially all of their life. Animals and plants host symbiotic microbial communities or the, their normal microbiota. And this normal microbiota is central to the welfare of the animal or plant meaning our microbiota helps us in digesting our food. E. coli can do that. It helps us by making some vitamins. I think it's vitamin B12 and vitamin K. We're a significant portion of this vitamin is made in an algae that grows at one of the poles, okay? What else was I going to say about them? Huh, I don't remember. So we are a microbial walking ecosystem because we have so many microbes either in or on us. The normal microbiota is usually found on the skin, the oral and nasal cavities, the upper respiratory tract, not usually in the lungs, but it can go into the lungs and then cause um, pneumonia. We do have the normal microbiota in our digestive tract and in our urethra. The normal microbiota is not normally found in the internal organs and tissues. So you normally do not find the normal microbiota, for example, on the heart or in the liver. 
The normal microbiota is important to us, not only uh, making vitamins for us, providing us with nutrients, digesting our food. So that would be uh, this one. I guess that's, oh, there it is there. Digest in there if you. Uh, the normal microbiota can also prevent for the growth of pathogens where the normal microbiota competes with the pathogen. Let's say I were to have uh, my scan, the recipient of, I don't know, MRSA, for example, it may not get established and grow on my skin because I've got a lot of more normal bacteria growing on my skin. And that could compete with the human pathogen. So the human pathogen, if it never gets started, like, like um, I guess I was being vaccinated against H1N1 flu vaccine, and I went and got vaccinated. And so therefore I couldn't get H1N1 bacteria. Any question about any of that? All right, the normal microbiota can also secrete toxins that inhibit the growth of pathogens. And we'll talk a little bit about this later where the normal microbiota makes a protein and it inhibits the growth of a similar organism from growing. So if you have E. coli right here and right here you have, oh, what's something similar to E. coli? C. diff, difficile. The uh, E. coli might stop the growth of the C. diff by secreting a toxic substances. And that is uh, what I showed you. Come on, there's something else. Finding it now. Come on. Not too far. Oh. Trying to remember what I wanted to state here. Uh, the normal microbiota can secrete toxins, and E. coli can secrete this toxin and then prevent the growth of C. diff. We'll talk more about that in a little bit, not today, obviously. The normal microbiota produce nutrients for us, helps digest our food like E. coli, as well as providing us with certain vitamins and growth factors. And as I stated, vitamin K and B12, I think are made, a significant amount of those vitamins are made by our normal microbiota. And then it becomes available to us. All right, any questions about any of that? If not, we're a little bit behind schedule, but I think I'm going to stop here because uh, I need about 15 minutes before I can start the lab. Uh, the good news is we have only one, two, three more slides, and I'm not going to cover slide 68 and above. Any questions? Not yet. All right. So I'll see you at the lab at 6.30. Is, uh, when we come back to the lab, is it the same um, meeting ID and password? No, the lab has a separate meeting ID and password. Okay, on that same page. Yeah, it should be on the same page. I'll check my Canvas website. I emailed it to you at the start of class. Okay. Not today, but the very first day. Okay. All right, I'll see you at 6.30. That doesn't sound like it's ending.